Good afternoon, everyone. We're so pleased you could join us today. I am Lara Sheridan, Catalyst Managing Editor. Today, we're pleased to share the stage with Onshape, a PTC SAAS business. Presenting today is Mike LaFleche, also known as The Professor. Mike is a Channel Technical Service Manager at Onshape. A fixture in the 3D CAD community, Mike previously worked for multiple SolidWorks value-added resellers in training and sales. He has also worked for companies in mechanical and electrical design positions using a myriad of CAD systems. Today, Mike will uncover the true cost of your CAD software and help us understand the cost of CAD software and how Onshape can help bring that spending under control. After Mike's presentation, we'll have time for a few questions. If you'd please type them into the Q&A section, we will answer as many as we're able. Thank you, Mike, for joining us, and I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Lara, and, and thank you for that really kind introduction. I'm really excited to, uh, to meet all of you here today and discuss uh, some of the things that uh, I've learned, as well as you know what some of our customers have learned over the years when it comes with understanding the total cost of your engineering CAD software environment. My, my background is, you know, I, I've been around for a while in the world of CAD and PDM. I've been on both sides of the fence. I've been on the, the, the provider side, right? You know, working for, for companies that provide these applications and services. And I've also been on the, in the real world, um, working for companies as a CAD administrator, uh, managing large CAD and PDM deployments. So, I have a really good sense of the uh, all of the things that are involved with with making um, you know making the cost uh, you know showing the cost of, of what we have. So let's just get right into it, right? So when you look at the costs of design software, the first thing that people usually think about is the actual subscription or capital investment of the actual software, the, the price that you sign the purchase order for, you get the budget for, you, know, you need the five seats of this CAD system X and, you know, the 20 seats of PDM system Y, right? And, and that's a fairly obvious thing. And we'll talk about that um, in detail in, in this presentation. But we'll also dive into some of the more, um, you know, not, not, not the, the things that are not on the top of people's minds typically. Now, many people may consider hardware, but efficiency and opportunity costs are also, you know, kind of some of the things you really have to think about um, when dealing with the total cost of ownership of your particular CAD environment. So I'm not uh, messing around here. I want you guys to really think and take notes during this session here, and, and I'm gonna say it like it is, okay? so. Um, you know, I try not to, uh, dance around the issues here and I'm going to really just talk about it based on what I've experienced, what, and, and what others have experienced and shared with me. So when it comes to the software cost, I'm going to, I'm going to pick, um, a mid range CAD system as the kind of template that we're going to talk about here, because that's what most people have, right? You know, most people have a uh, desktop CAD software, let's say, you know, SolidWorks or Autodesk Inventor, you know, Solid Edge from Siemens. I'm kind of thinking of that category of software when I'm putting together this, uh, you know, these, these uh, numbers here that you're going to be looking at. You know, of course, there's other software involved in the world of engineering, many, many other pieces. And there's also higher end kind of you know, enterprise level CAD software and PLM as well. That's that's out there. You, know, you think of companies, you know, like uh, or software packages like uh, Katia from Dassault Systems or NX, you know, formerly known as Unigraphics from from Siemens, right? You know, those are fairly more you know more expensive types of software. Um, so I'm not really going to dive into those costs because those software packages are already wildly high <laughs> in cost. So. Yeah, you know, I really wanted to pick something that that most people could relate to. But all of those same things are going to run rain true. So if you're using NX or Katia or one of these other higher end kind of CAD systems, everything here will be 
will, will should resonate, but it, it's it you're gonna have even greater savings. <laughs> but but there's reasons for those software packages and and you know they have high end functionality, so you might need those things. So, but anyway, let's roll back here and talk about uh, CAD software in general. So I used to work for a SolidWorks reseller, you know, for a long time, for 15 years. And, uh, you know, I had a really good time doing it. Um, I learned a lot. I've met a lot of customers, um, helped solve a lot of problems. And, you know, my, my background experience, I, I don't want to, you know, detract from that in any way. You know, I, I had a good time with those companies uh, over the years. Things have changed a little bit with the world of software as a service and, and the total cost of ownership. So I wanted to kind of compare total cost of ownership of something like a, a SaaS based system versus a, a traditional desktop installed system, right? That's my goal here. So let's look at the CAD software itself. Typically, it's $4,000 to $8,000 per user. I'm using US dollars here. Um, when you buy your actual upfront seat of software, you know, you're, you're either a new company starting off or you're an existing company and you want to buy a seat of CAD. You know, it's four to eight thousand dollars times however many users you need to buy, and and you know that's a, a single seat cost, right? And and that's how much it is. It's just you know depending on which package you want. There's other packages that you can roll into it with other advanced simulation, and there's always bundles and things. But but that's generally the range from four to eight thousand dollars per user. And then there's also a subscription fee on top of that. Some CAD companies have gone to a full subscription model where you don't have to buy the upfront software price between four and eight thousand dollars, and they've gone to a subscription model only. And those subscription numbers are actually higher than what I've outlined here on this page. So if if you're like a pure subscription software program, you're going to end up paying a little bit more per year per user. Um, but it's because you're going year to year uh, on your licensing instead of um paying that up for uh, software cost. So the SolidWorks, for example, it most for the most part, it's you buy the upfront software, and then you pay your subscription on top of that. So year one, you would, you know, pay the $48,000. And then you would also be paying a subscription too. And that subscription covers updates during the year, as well as um, any kind of a uh, cert, you know, uh, support requests are typically handled under these subscription uh, contracts. So that's what is involved with those uh, costs there. Now, there's also some other taxes involved when you want to start floating licenses. So this is a common question that comes up. You're spending all of this money on you know this upfront software, um, you know, and companies want to extract the most value possible out of it. So they'll ask for floating licenses. And when you have a floating license, you're paying more uh, for that upfront, right? It's it's at least $2,000 per installation per region uh, for a floating license server. Um, with, so that what it means is like you can check out a license out of the library, if you will, of licenses in the pool. So you buy 10 licenses and you install the software on 50 computers. 10 people at a time can run it. That's the way the floating license model works. And, you know, it's really because that upfront CAD software investment is so great. It needs to, you know, the, the customers need to, to, to extract more value out of it. But it only works per region. Um, so most software companies uh, that I know of in the CAD world will charge a floating license server per world geographic region. And it's not for the benefit of you as the customer. <laughs> it's really for the benefit of the sales organizations that are selling you this CAD software. Hopefully I don't get any angry emails from you know all the uh, the sales teams at, at the other CAD companies now, but um, that's why. It, it's purely for for sales reasons. you know there's sales numbers metrics. you don't want to share licenses across the uh, across the pond, right? That's actually illegal in, in most cases when it comes to traditional installed CAD software. Now, if you do want to float licenses across uh, the water, like follow the sun licensing, they, you know, they will offer these types of licenses, but they're at very high cost. In fact, it'll be between $8,000 and $16,000 per concurrent user if you want a floating uh, follow the sun licensing model. 
and this is just for CAD I'm talking about, just the design, to, you know, 2D, 3D design software. Um, you know, there, there are other things that are involved when you start getting in the PDM and PLM because those systems typically don't charge, you know, that extra cost when you float across different geographic regions around the world. It's pretty complicated, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, you know, why should you have to think about all of these things when all you want to do is just make some cool stuff in, that solves some problem for somebody? Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's not fun. And I live this life on both sides, you know, of the business. And, and I always thought I was an advocate for the customer, even when I was, you know, selling um, and supporting, you know, these systems over the years at, at, at former companies. Um, and I always found that to be a little bit odd, you know, that, that the, the, uh, the corporations would do that to the customers. Um, but that's just the software, upfront software costs. And everybody seems to have a good handle on that. Um, in here, but let, you know, let's start talking about the, the data management costs. And even if you're a single person company, there are data management costs to, to your CAD environment, but I'm, you know, I'm really going to dive in on companies that may have three to five or more users, um, because typically in those environments and scenarios, that's where people add PDM software. If you don't know what PDM software is or PLM, um, there, there's two different types you know, of uh, software for managing data, depending on the scope and needs of your company. But PDM software, PDM stands for product data management and PLM stands for product lifecycle management. So PDM is typically something that uh, a CAD company um, or, or a company that sells CAD software will uh, provide and, and sell to to uh, manufacturing companies to keep their data under control. As you may know, when you work with CAD systems, they generate uh, reams and reams of CAD files, many, many gigabytes of files. The files all have to have, you know, uh, naming conventions. You, know, you can't just like simply rename a file and ha expect the assembly where that part is being used to just update and rebuild properly. You know, you have to follow certain rules. So. Even without a PDM software installed on your computer or on your server at your company, uh, managing all these CAD files and CAD uh, versions that you're creating, you're going to have um, some sort of data management uh, software needed. So if you're in the situation where you you You've been designing products over the years. You know, you buy your CAD system. You, three, four years of time goes by when you're uh, doing your design work. You get to the point where you add more engineers. You have a lot of data. You're trying to work together on projects. That's when people start to buy PDM software. And I'm going to use, um, you know, the pricing of SolidWorks Enterprise PDM as one example because that's the one I have the most experience with. Um, when you buy PDM, you know, sometimes it comes, you know, one of the original CAD software packages will come with it. Like if I go back to the previous slide, you know, that four to $8,000 per concurrent user, they will provide a lightweight version of the PDM software if you get a certain license type, right? If you buy the middle or higher end package, it'll give you the light version of the PDM. But if you want to do anything that works with multiple sites around the world, or you want to customize the workflows or doing, you know, the way you do your approval processes need to be customized. Um, it's, it's really something that um, you, know, you need to, to consider. So each CAD user will need to spend almost $2,000 to gain access to the check-in and check-out system of PDM. Right. So like, let, let's look at this particular uh, map here that you see on the screen here. Let's say the headquarters of the manufacturing organization is in San Francisco on the West Coast of the U.S. You have the, you know, people working in that location, but you also need to share with people in all these other locations around the world. Um, those locations need to have, you know, servers. They need to have um 
database access. Yeah, and we'll get to this in, in later in the presentation. But right here, just looking at the upfront capital software purchase that you need to in, invest in PDM, you're starting off with that $2,000 per user. And if you want to contribute, if you're not a CAD user, but you want to like add stuff to the what they call a vault, you know, that's what PDM systems do. They vault your data and you have to check it in and check it out like you're going to a library when you want to work on data. Um, you have to pay for that. Like, you know, $700, you know, is, is the last known information I have on that. And just to view things, right? If you want to view things that are in the vault, you need to buy that as well. So, um, you know, if you don't have a vault and you're managing this on your own, there are still costs to that, but you're not spending software money on that. So that PDM software also has subscription fees of 20 to 30% uh, of the price of the, um, the original software. And guess what? When you buy PDM, you also have to buy uh, IT-related software, uh, SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server, database software is what these PDM systems run on. You know, some systems are, you know, run on Oracles. You, you need to buy Oracle processor licenses, which can end up, you know, being very costly. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, you know, you can spend $8,000 on that uh, very quickly. So you have to also consider that in the total cost of ownership of your uh, design environment. Now, when you're ready to deploy this uh, software, like I said, with my scenario where we had you know, a company going around for, you know, three or four years doing their design work, and then they've hired a bunch of people, and now they realize they have all this data and it's out of control and they need to uh, buy PDM. You need to purchase a consulting contract typically from the people that you're buying the software from, um, you know, to help with the installation and setup of the system, because it's not every day that you install a PDM system. You know, how would you be expected to know exactly how to deploy and manage this with best practices, it's usually a good idea to hire a company that has experience and does this all the time. Um, so usually it's a three to five day process to do your basic installation uh, of PDM per site. And that's uh, usually 2000 US dollars per day. Um, it might even be more now, but that's, that's what I remember um, back in the day. Uh, plus travel and other expenses. Um, but that does not include migrating all of your old data into the new vaulted system. So that's another ball of wax that you have to, to uh, understand and deal with because getting all that data from everybody's hard drive and everybody's like file server that's in, in the uh, IT closet, we need to figure out how to get all that data out and put it into a vault and that, that costs money, and it, it's usually not cheap uh, to do. So we're already pretty high up there as far as costs go of just the basic software licensing, right? You know, it's you're looking at like $10,000 per engineer on average just for the software, not counting consulting or SQL Server or anything like that. Then there's the hardware to contend with. So engineering software that's installed on a local computer requires a CAD workstation. And you know, if you're doing small, medium designs, you could get away with a lower end kind of computer. It doesn't even have to be a CAD workstation, but but it's a Windows computer. And if you're doing you know medium to large designs, let's say 100 parts and more, you're going to want a CAD workstation. And in those situations, you can see the pricing here. And I just pulled this from a um, presentation I saw a little while ago from one of the CAD companies out there. And they were advertising, they were doing some cross promotion with um, a, a company that sells CAD workstations, high end CAD workstations, really good, awesome CAD workstations. Um, and I like good computers, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I have a gaming computer here on my floor, I'm working from home here, right? You know, but I have my MacBook for my regular work when I use Onshape for my software as a service type application, because I can, I don't need a certain computer to run my CAD system that I run on every day. But for everything else out there, for, for SolidWorks, for Inventor, for you know all the other CAD systems, you would want a CAD workstation. Um, 
and the CAD workstation typically has uh, higher end processors. They typically have more advanced uh, memory, uh, faster memory. Um, the most important thing they typically have is a graphics card that's uh, certified by the CAD companies to to actually create the graphics um, and shaders. Um, it's really pretty interesting how how that whole process works. I'm not going to get into it today, but um, you know the graphics cards and the CAD companies do work you know um, together to make sure that the drivers work for each of the versions of the CAD system. So those graphics cards are pretty expensive. So you can see, you know, you can specify a minimum configuration on this page of about $3,100 for a CAD workstation. Uh, and that's even if you can get these kind of cards nowadays, right? Graphics chipset, you know, is a hard thing to get nowadays because of the global chip shortage uh, with the supply chain going on. And people buying out graphics cards for doing Bitcoin mining and all this stuff. It is a real, um, you know, that there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's getting in the way of getting your CAD workstation now um, that don't have anything to do with, with yourselves, but it's just the global supply chain of, of what's going on. Um, so that's something else that you have to consider when uh, calculating the total cost of your CAD system is the actual hardware that you're running on. Typically, you'll do a hardware refresh every three to five years. Um, you know, some companies do it sooner, some companies do it later. Um, but it's a cost that you have to include. You should also include the cost of other things like laptops and, and tablets and things, right? Um, most engineers that I work with, you know, they'll have their CAD workstation um, but they'll also have a laptop that they take on the road, um, you know, or work from home and, and, and certain things like that, right? So, you know, those laptops are actually pretty expensive if they're for CAD. A workstation class um, laptop would be similar in price to what you see here for these desktop units. Now, on the IT side of the house, you need to consider the servers. Now, you may already have servers, right? So... That's, it, it's a little bit of a stretch here, but I'm going to call it out, right? You, you, if you're a startup and you need to start buying all these servers, you know, that that's a big cost. But if you're an existing company and you already have servers, you, you're probably not going to include this in the cost, but there will be a server refresh at some point. And the servers that need to, uh, that you need to have to run PDM software are typically pretty, you, know, you want to have good uh, processing speed, you want to have fast memory, and you want to have, fast uh, hard disks. Um, so those servers are pretty expensive, you know, maybe $10,000. You get a rack mounted server and you, you start uh, throwing software on it. Um, you need a database server and you need an archive server for each site that your company has, right? So if you had a five site company, you have one database server and five archive servers. So that's $60,000 worth of hardware right there, just so you can share files around, right? Um, but how do you share those files around? Well, networking equipment, right? You need really good networking equipment if you're going to be sharing files around across your organization. And you, know, you need high-speed switches, um, routers, right? You know, MPLS lines, like, you know, to get the pipe of data to go from, in, in the previous example here, if I go back one slide, um, you, know, you have the, the head office in San Francisco. And all of these lines connecting these database servers to all these different sites, you need to, to get least line access, you know, from some major telecom. So let's say, you know, using AT&T business um, telecom, so, you know, um, services, you're paying for a pipe that will let you get a certain amount of bandwidth. So I remember when I was the CAD manager at a previous company, I used to uh, help manage the, the cost of that per month was staggeringly high to have the, the bandwidth required to replicate data from one office to another. It has to replicate gigabytes of data every night. And it was like, it was you know, several thousand dollars a month, you know, for that service. So you're, you know, most IT organizations wouldn't need that. They wouldn't usually include that in uh, a normal non-engineering kind of IT environment. But for engineering, 
data, which is huge amounts of data, you really do need to have that amount of bandwidth to, to replicate to all of these different sites that huge amount of data. Because if you don't replicate to each of the sites, um, the data access is actually extremely slow. Um, if you wanted to open a file from China to San Francisco, you know, it, it would drip that information over and that would take quite a long time to check out a, an assembly from the main vault into there if you did not do the replication. Even if you do have replication between the servers, it still takes a lot of work to keep that up and running. I would get calls in the middle of the night, you know, when, you know, the, the server wasn't uh, replicating properly, there were errors or something wasn't configured right. And, you know, that took a lot of time from the engineers trying to do their job, but also it took away from my sleep time, <laughs> which you know, is, is very important. Um, so think about that. You know, I, like I said, I hope you're really taking notes on this stuff because it, it's really important to understand all of the costs involved, not just the, the stuff that you put on a single purchase order to the people you're buying your CAD company, CAD system from. All right. Off of the kind of kind of well-known costs to, to some of the more maybe esoteric costs that you might uh, not have considered uh, in your production CAD and PDM environment. So um, hopefully you can see this image here on the screen. It's a, an image of guy playing Jenga here. And um, you know, that's kind of how it feels, you know, I think when running desktop installed software, it's it's like anytime you try to do something, it's like pulling that that peg out of the Jenga tower. And, you know, at any moment, that thing could come crashing down. And if you have to rebuild that Jenga tower, that takes some time, right? And that's exactly what happens every single day to customers that I talk to, not on our current system, because we're running software as a service and software as a service is, has much higher uptime than a traditional desktop environment. But, you know, if you crash, your application, let's say, you know, I have an image of a SolidWorks error report here. Um, I'm not picking on them, you know, personally. I'm just, it's just, you know, the what I have experience with, right? Um, but if 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 you go along, you're working for a couple of hours doing your CAD work, and inevitably a, a software crash happens, and you forgot to save, you've lost two hours of work. Now, even if you save every 30 minutes, you know, you've still lost 30 minutes of data. Um, then you have to deal with the reboot and start over and the redo of the 30 minutes of work, right? So if you had one crash per week, that's a, it's a really high expense, um, because you're building in all of this buffer time into your product, um, in your product development timeline, right? So when your engineering manager is budgeting out all of different costs for how long it's going to take and how many people need to work on this project and, um, all that stuff, they're building in buffer time typically because, you know, it might take 18 hours of design work to design the this new um, handling device or whatever. Um, some of that time in there is buffer time because they know certain things are going to happen that are going to get in the way, unforeseen things. But they are actually foreseen. You can count on your CAD system crashing. Uh, at some point, nobody has ever had, nobody's ever told me they've never crashed. Some people have much better experiences be with their CAD system when it comes to reliability and some have much worse. I have people that tell me they crash multiple times a day and I have some people that tell me, oh yeah, I crash a couple times a month here and there. Um, but any, any more than one is still bad, I think, because it, it just causes a heartburn. It, it's work that should not have to be redone, right? Imagine if your car worked that way. Imagine if every uh, couple, couple times a month, you know, you're driving down the highway and, and your car just shuts down in the middle of the, the high speed lane. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's not a good idea to, to use a, a car that does that to you, right? I mean, obviously there's, it's much more dangerous, you know, there's life or death situation here, but you know, it's, you know, I'm not saying CAD is life or death, but um, these crashes happen. It's not fun. It causes the blood pressure to go up. So maybe it is a life or death. I don't know. But um, I know it really ticked me off every time that would happen when I was using uh, a CAD system that, that would crash. Um, 
so you got this time spent rebooting, your time spent redoing lost work, which is just painful and arduous. Um, you're managing the software, right? So like if you are crashing, you're having problems doing something, you're probably going to open a support ticket with your company that, that sold you the, the CAD software. You're going to collect the whole bunch of data files. Yeah, you're going to submit an error report. You're going to upload CAD files. You're going to do a lot of investigation on your own time away again from engineering work. Right. You know, I just this this screen just, you know, freaks me out a little bit because it's an error. It's a, you know, the 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 software error report crashed. <laughs> and there's reasons why that would happen. Yeah, you know, I used to be a support agent you know, for these companies. So I it, it just it, it just. It, I, I'm laughing now, but you're not laughing when this happens to you when you're trying to submit an error report and you get a crash on the error report, right? So it, it's really uh, not funny. Um, so all of these things, you know, you, you'll end up going through network things as well. Like, you know, people will say, well, you should be really working locally. And, you know, have you done this, that, and the other thing? And there's all these things that just get in the way of getting your best work done. I think the most actual high cost item though in the world of a CAD system are the opportunity costs that are involved in running a CAD system that is uh, installed on a local computer. So the way all CAD systems work today is they work on files. There's only one or two systems that don't work on files. Onshape is one of them. There's there's other um, systems out there that that used to run on a database, you know, back years ago. But really, for the most part, there there aren't really any systems out there that are a true database system that are you know, like some CAD systems will say they're database driven, but it's really just a bunch of files in the background that are that's a database managing files. Um, that's not, you know, uh, it's kind of a stretch. It's kind of like, you know, database washing. You know, people are saying, oh, we have database driven software. It's really databases of files. Whereas, you know, with Onshape, the way we've built it, and I'll get to this later in the presentation, it, it's truly a database. There are no files anywhere, which enable a whole bunch of cool possibilities. But I'm stealing my own thunder. I'm going to get myself back on track here. So opportunity costs on a traditional file-based system. A file is the atomic unit of how all CAD systems pretty much work. You have part files, assembly files, drawing files, other types of files. You, you do that work and only one person at a time can edit a file. And that's just the rules of, uh, you know, DOS slash Windows file system or any kind of file system. Only one person at a time can actually work on a file, okay, uh, which locks it, right? Now, if you open a file that somebody else has open, it'll probably prompt you and ask you a question. It'll say, hey, yes, you know, user X has this file open. Would you like to make a copy of the file or open it read only? Don't make a copy. Please don't do that. It's the worst possible thing you can do because now you've lost your entire audit trail uh, of information. If two people are doing work on the same thing at the same time and they're not communicating with each other, you know, whoever overwrites the file and puts the file back in um, will win. PDM systems help with this, but PDM systems also have the same issue where only one person at a time can work. And they actually sell it as an advantage. They call it collaboration, but it's nothing like collaboration at all, you know, because it's still, it's just automating the, the kind of like process of locking files when people are working. It will prevent people from accidentally overwriting things that aren't in the right life cycle. It does not prevent people from copying files to their local hard drive and doing all sorts of extra work. And guess what? The dirty secret about PDM, I'm going to share with you right now, so don't don't tell anybody this, but PDM systems, people usually end up checking the data in only at the end of the design. <laughs> you know, it's like they'll do all this work on their local hard drive for hundreds and hundreds of hours. Nothing's backed up because the servers are backed up, but the end user hard drives aren't. And they'll be doing all their work and they'll check in their files that into this PDM system that they've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on just at the end. Like they're just using it as a 
a, a filing cabinet, right? You know, at the end when, and they might do a workflow to approve something at the end. And so it's really a, a big waste, you know, and people do that because PDM systems are painful to use. You know, it's like you have to check in and check out your files all the time. You, you, you know, it's it's actually slow sometimes when you're working remotely um, because, you know, the there's a lot of data, a lot of files going back and forth from the servers to desktops. So a lot of people would just try to avoid it because it just gets in the way. Um, so anyway, off my soapbox on the virtues of PDM. You know, PDM was a necessary evil. I mean, file-based CAD systems really need to have PDM to operate efficiently, but you know, it's not something people love. <laughs> so that's one thing, right? Only one person at a time can work when you have a PDM or a non-PDM system just on your file, you know, file server, because only one person at a time can work. So engineer, you know, let's call this guy Ed the engineer on the lower left corner of this slide here. And he's starting his design work. He's designing a mouse and he's doing all of his work on the mechanical components. And then he shares the design. You know, he says, hey, I'm done with my plastic uh, kind of part product development. I need to send this to the ECAD guy who's going to be doing, you know, some of the effort on the, the mounting and the circuit boards and other things that, you know, are mechanically related to the mechanical or elect electrically related to the mechanical design. And that person had to wait for Ed to be done, his work to, to do that, to check out and do their work on their piece of the assembly. And then maybe the manufacturing engineer, the person that's doing the mold design um, for the plastic parts, they need to wait for, for another piece to be done, you know, because the plastic part is being updated by Ed and the electrical guy. So, the longer it takes, you know, so let's say that the, the manufacturing engineer at the top finds a problem. You know, they, when they add a draft angle or put a, a radius in for a minimum tool radius or whatever it is, it, it interferes with something that the electrical guy did or, you know, something major needs to happen on the original design to get everything update. So you have to kind of go back to the drawing board, right? Just like the Roadrunner and <laughs> Wiley Coyote. Um, you start again and you go through this and and if you're good if you're a good company that manages like these metrics like the cost of delay and the cost of change the longer it takes to find the problem in your design process the higher that cost of change will be because you've put in all the hours of engineering but you may even have gotten to the point where you've created rapid prototypes 3d prints you may even gone and cut a small production run a small um urethane mold or something to do something, you know, just, you know, before you go to full scale production, right? And that that's a uh, big cost, right? Because only one person at a time can do work. And that makes it so, pro you know, when you have this serial process, problems are found later and you're leaving out your suppliers and customers until things are almost perfect, right? And, and that's like really far down that process. It's really a, uh, a, the biggest cost of all is just the design of the system. So, so really you should be asking yourself these questions, right? Are you employing it people or CAD admins to keep your CAD software running? You know, this might be one of your jobs, right? I know it's usually your best engineer ends up being your CAD admin. Um, which really kind of stinks because that best engineer could be doing much more important things, I think, um, than, than keeping the system up running. If, they, if they're a really great engineer, they might be, you know, creating all sorts of, of designs instead of uh, getting woken up in the middle of the night to, to update the replication system, right? Um, the bigger the company is, you'll probably have dedicated people to this, right? Um, and those people might not be you know, uh, engineering designers, they may have that background, but they'll end up being a full-time person. The last company I worked at before joining Onshape, you know, I was part of a 10 person CAD admin team for all of our locations around the world. So that's millions of dollars of payroll locked up because people, you know, because they needed to keep CAD system up and running in a, in a smooth way, right? Millions of dollars, 10 people, right? I mean, well, not, 
Yeah, almost a million. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm estimating based on, you know, what I know about, you know, what people are paid in different parts of the world and everything. But, you know, the burden cost of keeping an employee with, you know, benefits and, and other things, it, it's a large cost. Now, some people will prefer to have their um, consultants or, or, you know, evaluated resellers come in and do some of these services too, because they don't want to hire a full-time person to do it. Um, it's obviously a little bit more expensive, you know, um, or it might be a little less expensive in the long run, but you're paying people, you know, your VAR to come in, you know, a couple times a year to do stuff that, that cost that those costs add up. Um, another thing, are you redoing manufacturing runs because you're working on the wrong version of a part, right? You know? Ask yourself, what's your scrap rate? You should probably look into this at your company to see what your scrap rate is or what your what your manufacturer, you know, if you're not doing the manufacturing yourself, if you're the OEM product designer and you're doing, you're sending work out to a contract manufacturer, you might ask what their scrap rate is, right? I, I think they would be, I don't know if they would be happy to share that with you, but you know, it would be interesting to have a, a lunch with your uh, suppliers and, and kind of get that information and try to understand you know, what the scrap rate is and understand what the reason for the scrap is. You know, was the reason because they were working on the wrong version of the part? There are many other reasons, right? I mean, it could have been uh, operator error on the CNC machine or whatever it is, but um, some of that could be in your control. Maybe not all of it, but some of it, right? Um, but this one just ticks me off the most, right? And I, I can't believe, you know, if, if, if there were some finance people on this call, I like that, that pay for the actual CAD software. I think they would be just as ticked off of me, if not worse, because it's not my money. <laughs> it's their money. Are you paying for subscriptions without installing it or using tech support? So what I mean by that every year, CAD systems come out with a new version, right? You know, CAD system X 2020, 2021, 2022, and you're paying your subscription, right? But it's quite rare for companies, the bigger you get, in fact, the bigger the company is, the more you will not install the latest version every single year, because it's a huge pain to do the testing and deployment of the CAD systems and the PDM systems yourself. So most companies will do it every other year, sometimes every third year. Um, but guess what, you're paying your CAD company for those subscriptions, whether you've done that or not. Right? So you're, you're throwing away at least half of the money if you're, you know, doing it every other year. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a huge amount of money. You're just throwing in the fire and flushing away. It's like you're paying for something that you're not going to use. Okay. I hope this is, this is salient here. I, 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 I would be really surprised if there are people on this call that have not heard or seen of this. It might not be happening at your current company, but I bet, you know, if it, it, you know, you've probably worked or heard of a company that where this happens, um, it's a huge amount of wasted money. And if your CFO or, you know, head of purchasing or whatever found out that this was happening, they would be pretty ticked off and, and rightfully so. But it's just such a pain in the butt to keep the, the software up to date that it, it's not worth the effort the, to um to do the upgrade right you know it's uh it's uh, the last company i worked at before joining on shape it was a six month to nine month process to plan the deployment and do a sandbox environment and do the testing to make sure everything was up to date if you're a medical device company that's even more arduous because um you know you have to test even more features um, every time you're doing your, your yearly upgrades. So, um, I'm sure this resonates with some people. So that's why Onshape exists because of all of these, uh, this death by a thousand cuts, <laughs> you know, that, that I'm talking about here. Um, Onshape is a software as a service, you know, S A A S. Anytime you see the word SAS anywhere, um, it means it's a, cloud operated system that you don't have to install right and SAS has huge benefits right there SAS has been is in use at a lot of different companies a lot of different software applications right salesforce.com 
uh, like Google Workspace, which is like Google Docs, Google Sheets, you know, Office 365 to a certain degree has some SaaS built in, but there's desktop installed stuff too. So I don't, I don't consider that a full SaaS system, but things that you never have an installation for like Jira and Confluence, like from Atlassian, that would be SaaS, you know, for managing your software deployment and, and stories and tracking. Uh, Salesforce.com for it's tracking your customer relationship management and sales orders and support issues like Zendesk. And, and these typical, you know, that's, you know, for doing uh, support, right? Uh, you don't install software, nor are there files going back and forth anywhere with these solutions, right? Like even with Google Docs, there are no files really going back and forth. You know, it, it's a database that's made to look like files, but it's not really a file. And, and, you know, they, they do it that way because they, there's certain things that Google Docs does. Like you can actually have people working together at the same time in the same Google Doc, right? Everybody's probably heard or seen that or experienced it themselves. And the reason they can do that is because they're not really file-based. They're not using the rules of DOS and Windows. They're using the rules of their own proprietary database technology to make that happen, right? And Onshape is just like that, right? We're using, you know, very robust database technology that's been proven that other very large SaaS companies use. And we've discretized the services for Onshape so that there's modeling services, drawing services, and they're not installed in your computer. They're hosted, right? They're hosted on AWS. You know, everybody knows who AWS is, right? Amazon Web Services for, um, you know, hosting. They, they're the world's most prolific uh, hosting um, provider. Yeah, there are others out there, Azure from Microsoft and it's Google Cloud and, and things like that. Um, but AWS is well known and, and very well respected, high security, high uptime. They have known, you know, they they you know they they work with government agencies. You know, they, it, it's very high tech and high high security, um, and that's what Onshape is is hosted on. So the benefits of SaaS, right? Like I mentioned earlier, kind of like with the Google Docs example, global co-editing. So instead of waiting for one person to finish their design and um, passing the baton from one person to another, in Onshape, in, in any SaaS program, whether it be Onshape or not, but you know, I'll just say Onshape because that's where I work, <laughs> right? You know, we have the ability to work together. You can actually have people working and and stacked stacking the work yeah i'm not saying everybody's in the same document at once at all times you know that's ridiculous you know but if you can stack some work and not be blocked by people that you know you know you can all kind of find the problems earlier if if the mechanical engineer the electrical engineer and the manufacturing engineer could all get into the same document and start working together um, they can do that. They can work together and separately with our branching. You know, you can see an image here on the left side of our, our version control timeline showing the different uh, aspects of a particular design here. You can branch off and have different uh, parallel paths of your design at the same time as well and merge ideas together after if you don't want to all be in the same sketch at the same time doing work. But, you know, it's up to you. But you can you can stack work and save a huge amount of time and cost uh, because of that. It requires you to change your workflows. So you would not go to SaaS or to Onshape unless you wanted to change your kind of way of doing engineering, I think. I mean, you could use Onshape in other SaaS programs sort of like you use your file-based systems, but I think you'd be it would be a huge waste of uh, of the uh, opportunity that you have to improve your design process, right? It, you know, you know, if you think about, you know, a lot of modern companies will do Kanbans and, you know, find uh, projects where they can improve their engineering process. This, you know, implementing a system like Onshape is is the best thing you can do in a Kaizen type process to to improve your your uh, productivity. So. Uh, I would encourage you to just take a look at Onshape as one example and maybe even try out uh, Onshape on a, on a project where you, you think you would have the opportunity to collaborate and work together and investigate to see if this is a better way of working. Because with Onshape, you, know, you don't have to buy the servers. 
You don't have to have special computers. You don't have to, you know, do all this fancy setup. You just pay for a subscription for a year and, and use it, right? It's it's not like a, a major, um, big uh, capital upfront investment. Uh, it's also so so yeah, no more silos, right? That's what I'm saying. Like people don't have to work in silos anymore. We're we're in an engineering department. We're not on a farm in a grain silo. People can work together. This is the year 2021 for for crying out loud. We shouldn't be working like we're on the drafting board because that's all we did when we went from digital transformation into 2D and 3D CAD. We just copied all of the same workflows and processes from the drafting board days with the filing cabinets and the copies on the blueprint machine with the ammonia and in the drafting boards with the, you know, the, the vellum paper and the eraser shields and all that. All we did was just copy that to a digital world. And that, that was, that's all we've had until we rethought things on a board in a cloud SaaS program to, to, to think in a more, uh, modern fashion. We have the tech technology to do it now, right? Um, SAS is far more convenient beyond, you know, if you haven't connected the dots yet, you know, I'm sure you realize it's far more convenient, right? To, to have a SAS system. There's lots of IT departments that are looking at, you know, cloud first, right? You know, it's probably a phrase you've heard uttered in uh, IT meetings and things like that, especially in a, you know, medium to large company, you'll hear that. Um, with Onshape, no servers, cloud first, less IT costs, but you can also have the device of your choice, right? You know, I mean, I, I run a MacBook because I can, right? <laughs> you know, I don't have to run a big, huge Windows uh, Dell CAD workstation and call the chiropractor every uh, month to get my back fixed from carrying my 25-pound uh, laptop with the huge power brick and everything anymore. I can just have a MacBook Air and run... Uh, run my CAD system on any device. I can access it on my phone. You know, all my data is there. I don't need to pack and go any information or bring flash drives around for heaven forbid. You know, don't, don't use flash drives. Please do not use thumb drives. Flash drives is the worst security you could possibly have is moving those files back and forth. It's a huge threat vector um, using those devices. Most companies ban them nowadays, but if you haven't banned them, I would, I would, really consider not using flash drives anymore. It's just there, there's too much that can go wrong. Malware, spyware, you know, I'm not going to scare anybody, but I hear the stories all the time of this. Um, and then uh, control, right? So you have no more silos, you have convenience, and you have much more control in a SaaS based environment. Um, you know, I, I don't have time to give a, an on shape demonstration today to kind of demonstrate this, but it, you know, we'd be happy, obviously, to you know to to show you how this works. But think about how Google Docs works when you hit a share button in a in a Google document. You hit the share, and you say, "Okay, I want to give you view only access with comment rights. I want to give you edit rights, but I don't want you to make a copy, and I don't want you to share it with anybody else. But I do want you to do some work and make comments on it, and then." You know, next week, I don't want you to have that access anymore, and I'm going to turn that access off. That's what I mean by control. And this type of control is simply not a possibility in a file-based CAD system. You simply cannot have that level of granular, high-secure control over your CAD information because it's all based on files. And files just beget more files, <laughs> okay? the Once you send the file off by email or Dropbox or any method that you have, that file's gone forever and you're not getting it back, right? We're here in a centralized application where everybody in the whole world is on the same version of the CAD system and the software as a service system. Of course, everybody can work together seamlessly because you don't have to worry about the version control conflict. You know, like, in case you didn't know, like, if you have CAD system 2020 and you share somebody a, a file from your CAD system and they only have CAD system 2018, they can't open your file. You, what do you do? Well, then you end up exporting a separate file, step file or DXF file. Now you have more copies that are out there that you know could cause something to go wrong. So total lack of control with a file-based system, even with PDM. PDM will not stop this. PDM will give you a nice vault where you can have all of your blessed information right there, but it 
there's still lots going on outside the PDM. Okay. So with Onshape, you know, we built in version control from day one. You always have your, your whole history of your design forever and ever, which means, you know, even if your web browser crashed or you threw your computer in the river, you wouldn't lose any data because the data is central. It's hosted on AWS. You know, you just open it up on another computer or you, uh, you want to go back to a previous version of your design. You have it all here. So it's really a, a huge uh, thing, right? And, you know, there's numerous examples you know, that you could look at, right? You can go to the, uh, you know, look at like companies that are switching from, let's say, SolidWorks. Um, and you want to hire one more person and you want to look at the, the return on investment of switching to a SaaS based system, you know, that the costs will be pretty uh, staggering, right? So, you know, think about that, right? If you needed to add one more seat, that would cost between five and ten thousand dollars. And then maybe you need to buy a PDM system for another fifty thousand dollars, right? Or you could just go to the uh, SaaS based world and just pay four times, you know, on shape is, you know, averages about twenty one hundred bucks a year, right? So, you know, you, you see the savings right there immediately. Um, but getting started with on shape, if you're a startup is obviously even a bigger ROI, right? Because you didn't have to get servers in the first place. You didn't have to buy the software up front, right? You know, the team didn't want to install a PDM on their local site because they, they don't believe in having file <laughs> on a hard drive or a server at their office. So they use Google Drive and, you know, maybe down the road they'll get PDM, <laughs> right? And then they'll have to go through the whole thing. But if you start with Onshape or something SaaS, you never just have to worry about that. You don't have to cross that bridge. And finally, you know, the bigger the company, the bigger the savings, I think, especially when it comes to multi-site workflows, as I discussed earlier, you can kind of connect dots, you know, you know, especially when you add other users and CAD administrators, it's really, you know, a, a big amount of cost savings, you know, the bigger uh, the company uh, gets. So what I want to do is, is open it up to any questions. I know we're we're coming up to time. I was... I was starting to go a little bit, um, you know, my, my sermon was starting to uh, really go uh, <laughs> deep in fire and brimstone. So, so I lost track of time a little bit, but I think we have time for questions. Okay. Um, so let's just do one real quick one. Um, is there a restriction on file size? And what if I go over my allocation? Oh, that, that's a really cool question. So so interestingly enough, we don't care <laughs> at Onshape. You can store as much as you want because we're not storing files, really. We're we're dealing with a database, right? So it's it's a different kind of paradigm. Um, you can use Onshape as much as you want. You just pay for access by user, and and you have uh, and you have access to Onshape, right? And create as much as you want. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Okay. So thank you, Mike. I really appreciate your time and thank you to your team also. And thank you everyone that has attended. We have a few questions that have come through, um, but we have run out of time. Um, we will follow up after the webinar to answer those, those questions directly to everyone. And uh, a recording will be published on our website. And for further information about Onshape, please go directly to onshape.com. And again, Mike, thanks so much for your presentation. This is really enlightening. I think a lot of people have learned a lot today. Good. I hope so. I, I can't wait to see everybody's notes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Good night right. and Bye -bye. good day. Bye-bye.